Today on Answers with Bayless Conley. I don't know if you realize it or not, but God's goal for you is not heaven. God's goal for you is growth. His ultimate goal for you is not heaven, it's growth. That you grow in love, in grace, in faith, in knowledge, in discernment, in generosity. And once you get to heaven, it's not over. You will continue to grow there. Hi, I'm Bayless Conley. I've been a pastor going on four decades. But if you'd seen some of the earlier chapters of my life, you probably never would have guessed that I would have ended up serving in gospel ministry. Growing up, I was raised a normal Southern California kid. But as a teenager, my life quickly spiraled into drug and alcohol addiction and a search for answers. After a number of near-death experiences, I came to know Jesus and experienced His life-changing power. I found out that He was what I'd been searching for and that there were answers in His Word. In life, we all face uncertainty, whether it's financial troubles, relationship valleys, a health crisis, or just trying to discover your purpose. One thing is for certain, God sees you, He loves you, and no matter what you're facing, He has the answers. First Peter chapter one, verse 23 through verse 25. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. We are given birth through the word of God, through the incorruptible seed, when it's preached to us and we believe it, the Holy Spirit changes us inwardly. It's interesting, in John's gospel, when Jesus spoke to Nicodemus, he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. So no one can see the kingdom of God if they're not born again. And Jesus went on to say, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. In other words, that which is born of the Holy Spirit is the human spirit. The part of you that gets impacted initially in salvation is your spirit. That's the real you. That's the real me. I'm a spirit being. You can't see me. I live in this house. Happens to have a lot of freckles, not as much hair as it used to have. But this is my, my earth suit. I'm a spirit being. Every one of you, you're a spirit. And when a person embraces Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and literally changes their spirit. Here in 1 Peter, it's called a new birth. Jesus called it a new birth. But then he said, all flesh is like grass. The grass withers. Now, whether you're saved or unsaved, you are a spirit being and you will spend eternity somewhere. And whether saved or unsaved, the withering process is taking place in your body. Have you noticed? <laughs> yeah, in my heart, I still feel very, very young, but every time I look in the mirror, I get zero confirmation <laughs> of that inward feeling. I look in the mirror and it shouts, gravity is real. <laughs> You're getting old. And I don't like it, but the, the fact is one day, the flower's going to fall. I'm going to step out of this earth suit, out of my body, and step into eternity. As every person will, saved or unsaved, you will leave that body and step into eternity. The thing is, you cannot leave this life and live with God in the next life if you're not born of God during this earthly life. You can't spend an eternity with Him if you're not born of Him in this life. You will spend an eternity somewhere separated from him, and that will not be a happy ending. But we must be, as he put it, born of the word. You've been born of the incorruptible corruptible seed of the word, which by the gospel is preached to you. But in order to believe the gospel, it must first be proclaimed. The scripture puts it this way in Romans 10, verse 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not heard, or whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they've not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? Verse 17, so then faith comes by hearing 
and hearing by the word of God. And the Greek word for word there is rhema. It means the spoken word of God. Somebody has to speak it. Somebody has to proclaim it. Somebody has to scatter that, that incorruptible seed into the soil of people's hearts so that they can believe and be saved. You know, Jesus said in Mark 4, the kingdom of God is if a man casts seed on the ground and then he sleeps. And the, spree, the seed springs and grows up. He did no help. So listen, first, we're given birth through the word. Secondly, we grow through the word. 1 Peter 2 and verse 2. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. I don't know if you realize it or not, but God's goal for you is not heaven. God's goal for you is growth. His ultimate goal for you is not heaven, it's growth. That you grow in love, in grace, in faith, in knowledge, in discernment, in generosity. And once you get to heaven, it's not over. You will continue to grow there. God's goal for us is maturity. And there's something here that we can't afford to miss. God wants us to grow together. He talks here about growing through the word, and then he immediately marries the idea of growth with community. Look in verses 4 and 5, chapter 2. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also as living stones are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Verses 9 and 10. But you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but have now obtained mercy. And together we're to proclaim his praises in a very dark world. But immediately talks about growth and then folds it into the idea of growing together in community. In fact, Ephesians, it'll be on the screen. The same thought is there, although it's, it's a bit more clear. Ephesians chapter 2 and verses 19 to 22. Now therefore... You are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows. Everyone say together. together. He wants us to grow together. The whole building fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together, say together, together, for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. Now, I did a study, Old and New Testament, but in particular in the New Testament, of every way that God wants us to grow together. All of the opportunities that we have to grow together. And here's a bit of a short list. God wants us to grow in prayer together. God wants us to grow in worship together. He wants us to gather together for fellowship and to grow in that area. He wants us to gather together for encouragement, for teaching, for refreshing, and there should be growth there. The scripture says that we are to gather together and to grow together when it comes to considering issues and challenges that face the church. And the scripture also says we're to work together in spreading the faith. We've been born again through this incorruptible seed of God's word. And now God wants us to grow together in our ability to take that same word to a lost and a dying world. Listen to this. Philippians 1.27 makes it clear. It says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together 
for the faith of the gospel. Say together. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. Any of you have kids or been to a, a soccer game and watch kids? If you just have a bunch of kids running around on the field with no plan, with no synchronized strategy, it is, it is comical. And very rarely are any goals scored, and those kind of teams never win. But the teams that have a synchronized effort and their coach has given them a strategy, they're the ones that are successful. The ERV version puts the verse this way. Work together like a team to help others believe the good news. Work together like a team to help others believe the good news. Now back to, to Peter. In his letter, Peter spends a lot of time about how to influence others with the gospel. And he certainly makes it clear that it needs to be proclaimed. We've already talked about that. Peter says, you know, we need to influence a lost world with the gospel, and the gospel must be proclaimed. However, he takes the lion's share of his writing and of his time talking about another vital component of spreading the gospel. And it's this, building bridges over which the gospel can travel. That individually and as a community, we need to embrace the simple strategy, we could put it this way, of letting our light shine. Because the truth is, it takes a lot more effort to build a bridge than it does to make a proclamation. It takes a lot more concerted effort to shine than it does to talk. It takes more effort to build the bridge than it does to bring the goods across the bridge. So let me share with you several bridges that Peter talks about that can and should be built over which we can carry this incorruptible seed of the word. Bridge number one, are you ready? is the bridge of good works. 1 Peter 2 and verse 12, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, the unsaved, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. You can literally turn opponents into believers via good works. Jesus put it this way, Matthew 5, 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. It can be anything from offering free babysitting for a couple so they can have a night out, offering to go to the, the market for your neighbor. Look, I know you're busy. I'm headed to the store. Can I pick up anything for you? I was just thinking about you. It's just the simplest thing. Put the gospel in work clothes. It's amazing the bridges that that lays down over which the gospel can travel. Well, you'd be surprised how a good act of kindness in a world gone wrong can soften someone's heart and make them receptive for the message where otherwise they may not be willing to hear it. All right, the second bridge that we can build is the bridge of good citizenship. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men as free, yet not using your liberty as a cloak for vice. But as bondservants of God, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Submit yourself. I know some people don't already like this part, but it is in your Bible. <laughs> Submit yourself to every ordinance of man. Obey the law for the Lord's sake. Well, I don't, I don't like paying my taxes. I don't either, but I do it anyway. Honor the king. Honor those in authority. Well, I don't agree with him politically. The Bible says to honor your leaders anyway. 
It builds an amazing bridge when you're a law-abiding citizen. And the only out you have is if there's a law of man that directly violates the law of God. Then we have a higher law that we need to abide by. God is the final authority in our life. But if it's just a matter of preference and it's not a matter of scriptural mandate, friend, the scripture says we must submit ourselves to every law of man for the Lord's sake. And we must honor all men and especially honor the king, honor those in authority. Carrying a spirit of honor with you, I'm telling you, it will build bridges over which the gospel can come. It will put to silence the foolishness of ignorant men, the scripture declares. The third one we're going to speak, speak about is the bridge of a healthy marriage. 1 Peter 3 and verse 1. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear or respect. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. And then, guys, just so you know you're not off the hook, verse 7, husbands likewise dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers may not be hindered. I want you to notice he ties a healthy marriage in with evangelism. Even if your husband doesn't obey the word, he can be one without you preaching. Just by you sowing good things into the marriage and having this, this meek and quiet spirit. And he talks about husbands treating their wives with dignity and with love. And you know, the, the truth is in Ephesians chapter 5, where it talks about marriage, it says that marriage actually is a type and a shadow of redemption. In marriage, a man leaves his father and mother is joined to his wife because of his great love for her. Jesus left his father in heaven and was joined to the human race because of his great love for us in order to redeem us and take us on to himself. There's something on a very deep level that a marriage speaks into the heart of a person. We live in a society where marriage is not highly regarded and it is quite unusual these days to find people that have been married decades and decades that have held course. And I'm telling you, it's, a, it's an amazing bridge over which, which the gospel can travel. You know, Janet and I were going on 38 years. I like to think we have some credence and some sort of a platform to share. In fact, you would be surprised. Maybe you wouldn't be. But quite often, and that's not an exaggeration, quite often I get questions of the nature from all sorts of people. They find, find out how long we've been married. Like, how in the world have you done it? You still seem to be in love with your wife. You guys are doing great. Things seem to be fresh. You know, what's the secret? All right, there's the bridge. Here comes the seeds. Well, let me tell you, Jesus Christ is at the center of things. We don't always get along, but we work stuff out and able to share the gospel with people over that bridge of a healthy marriage. Now, if you've had a failed marriage or two or three or, or whatever, listen, if you get into another relationship. It's worth it to do the hard yards. It's worth it to sow into that marriage. It's worth it to make that thing work. So if you're going to do it again, make it work for your own benefit, but also it gives you an amazing platform to share with people because the world is looking for things that work. They're looking for relationships that last. All right, finally, the fourth bridge we're going to talk about is the bridge of love in the church. 1 Peter 3, verses 8 and 9. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers. Be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Love his brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be compassionate. 
Jesus put it this way, John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Years ago, we're having a potluck and there's a lady in the church whose husband has never come. He's a member of another major world religion. He was raised in that religion, not interested in Christianity, not interested in the church, won't come, but she enticed him with a promise of food. <laughs> so he comes out of the potluck because he hears there's going to be a bunch of great food. And while, you know, things are going on, people are laughing, there's music playing and everybody's eating. And I watch him, he's standing there with his arms crossed and there's this look of amazement on his face. And I went over to him, introduced myself. He said, oh, you're the pastor. Yeah, I've, I've heard about you from my wife. He said, you know, I'm seeing something here I've never seen before. He said, unless I'm mistaken, this is genuine love. And I know these people are from different backgrounds, different cultures. He said, I've never seen anything like this. He said, would you come to my home and talk to me about this? I said, sure. We made an appointment. I went to his house, sat in his living room, and shared the gospel with him. Now, he didn't get saved, but he very courteously listened, asked questions. But shortly after that, his older brother came to the church and got saved. And then his daughter gave her life to Christ. Now, he left planet Earth some years back. I don't know if he made a decision for Christ. I hope that he did. But the thing that got his attention, that opened his heart, was love in the church. It built a bridge, and he invited me across the bridge you know, with the incorruptible seed. Otherwise, he wasn't interested in it. Now, once we begin building bridges, we need to make ourselves ready. The scripture says, 1 Peter 3 and 15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear or with courtesy and respect. Somebody says, look, why do you live the way you live? Why, why would you spend that much of your Sunday at a church? I mean, you could be at the beach. Why do you do that? You give how much of your money, you know, to, to charitable stuff? Why do you do that? When people ask, be ready with an answer. That means prepare ahead of time. And it doesn't have to be complex. I mean, it can be as simple as just four things. You know, I had no peace. Somebody told me about Jesus. I put my trust in him, and he gave me peace. Seed planted. And you can weave your story in there, but, but think about it. Be, be ready, he said, to give an answer, to give a defense to anyone that asked you. Why do you do the things you do? And you, you're asking nothing in return, and you, you volunteer all this time to help people, and what are you getting out of? You get nothing. Why would you do that? You know, how is it that you've got such a good marriage? You know, what's the secret? When people ask you, be ready. Even if it's just four simple things you can share with someone. Because the truth is, you know, bridge building is incredibly important. But there will come a time for proclamation. Because they can't believe in the one they haven't heard of. And they can't hear unless someone tells the story. And so I think God wants us all busy building bridges and being ready to make the proclamation when the opportunity comes. We need to grow together in getting this incorruptible seed to a lost and a dying world. I don't believe that it's by chance that you're here today or that you're listening via live stream or through some other medium I believe God is trying to get your attention. Yes, you. He knows you. He loves you. He knows your ups and downs, your ins and outs, your comings, your goings. And he loves you, as Pastor Kenneth said earlier, fiercely. And he wants you to know him. The scripture says that God so loved the world that he gave a free gift, his only begotten son, that whoever, that's you, that's me, whoever believes in him wouldn't perish, but they'd have 
eternal life. If you want to spend an eternity with God, you must be born of God in this lifetime, friend. I want to pray a simple prayer with you. Wherever you are in this auditorium, wherever you are listening, if you'll tie your heart around these words and be sincere and really talk to God, I believe He'll meet you. Without a sincere heart, the words mean nothing. But if, if you'll put your heart behind them, God will meet you with you. If you're a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter, time to come home, son. Time to come home, daughter. This is your moment. No one else can make this decision for you. You alone. Would you put a hand on your heart? Would you pray with me? You say, oh God, I come to you. With all of my heart, I believe. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I believe he died on the cross to pay for my sin. And I believe he was raised from the dead. Jesus, I give my life to you. I confess you as my Lord and Savior. From this moment forward, my heart is yours. I hope that you enjoyed the broadcast today, and I'd like to ask you something. If you watch on a regular basis, if you find blessing in this, please pray about doing something to help us continue with the broadcast. Pray for us, certainly, but sow a financial seed. What we do is very expensive, but it's worth it for the souls that are saved and the lives that are encouraged, and you can be a part of it. A lot of people are getting involved, and I'm asking you to pray about getting involved as well. God bless you. Hi there. We have a daily email devotional that I believe can be of great benefit to you. You know, when we take God's Word in every day, it helps us become established in the Lord. Make room in your daily schedule for God's Word by signing up for Bayless's devotionals, available on your phone, tablet, or PC. Take time to sow the seeds of God's Word into your life every day with this free email devotional. We're grateful for the friends and partners of Answers with Bayless Conley who help make this program possible.